Coming. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't come to hear me though. So I'm very quickly going to say uh, we're really happy that Jack could be with us. Fantastic uh, professional photographer. And he's going to talk to you about some of his workflow, some of his images. And uh, I shall hand you over to Jack. And if you have any questions, <clears throat> either during or after, just shoot your hand up and, and Jack, will, I'm sure, will be happy to help with that. But over to you. Thank you, Jack Lodge. Thank you. I, is that working? Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, that's weird. I can hear myself fully here. Yeah. That's not going to help. That's going to Okay. I'm going to have to deafen myself. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the process of landscape photography, for me anyway. Um, what I enjoy about it, how I work, what my workflow is as I go throughout photography. Um, because a lot of people think it is just going to a location, taking a picture, going home. It's really not. I wish it was. Sometimes it is. Um, other times you'll be out for three, four, five, six hours and you don't get anything. And that's just what that's just part of the process. So a little bit about me. Um, my name's Jack. I come from Wimborne down in Dorset. Uh, so I drove up today. Lovely area. We've got so many amazing seascapes, landscapes, um, woodlands, pretty much everything within an hour drive. So really lucky to live here. Um, that's down um, down on the coast. Um, also a little bit, getting a little bit more adventurous. So done a few Norway trips. Um, so getting a little bit out there. Um, I actually started in architecture though. So I haven't been a photographer or done photography all my life. I've not got the whole had a camera passed down to me story. Sadly, I uh, just stumbled across it. I was doing architecture at university, um, started doing a lot of street photography and I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is enjoyable. I did a sunrise in Venice while I was out there with the university and I was hooked. So I came back home, got a camera, um, just a little Canon 100D and then I started and I just fell in love with it. So that's my story so far. Um, went full time in August 2022, so literally two months ago. Took the leap. It was scary. It's uh, been about six, seven years leading up to it, but I just thought if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. I'm 28, so it's time to make the leap. So I'm going to split it into what I call the four P's, and this is really cheesy. So if you <laughs> feel free to laugh if they're really cheesy, but um, I call it plan, photograph, process, and print. So there's four parts to me about the whole process of landscape photography. You can't do one of these without the other, I don't think. You can stop at the photograph and processing, um, but because we're at photo speed, I thought I'd obviously throw in a little bit of printing, um, shameless plug, but uh, you, you have to print to see an image. Um, you really do. To, to see the final image on a screen and then come out as a print is a kind of, you relive the whole experience. Um, so in landscape photography, it's so important. Starting off with planning, um, that's my little, or our little dog, Pippa. Um, so she's my little scouting companion. So there's three little things that I do that I thought I'd show you guys. So obviously dog is amazing because we can just go out all the time. She needs walking anyway, so we'll go explore new locations. I use a Garmin, um, that allows me to track my routes. So every single scouting location I go to, I'll track the route. If I see anything interesting, I'll stop it. And then I can actually look at the route again when I get back home as well as using a mobile phone, because you can take a photo and save the GPS, but I much prefer to have it on my wrist. And then Google Pins, um, that there is a little insight into where I live um, and all the places I've visited. So each one has a little description. It might be beech tree or oak tree or something. Um, and I just pin it there. And if I notice that it's gonna look good in a different season or certain conditions, I'll be able to go on my phone, look in say August or rainy weather or overcast and be able to go to that spot. So it's just a little bit of planning and preparation um, that goes into that bit of photography. Next thing is weather. Um, as we all know, it's absolutely mental. So this is just a little example. Um, I'm going to show you one photo or one photo at the end, but there was three photos leading up to that one photo. So first thing I did is check the weather. As you can see here, no low clouds. So I instantly knew I wanted to go down to Studland because there was a new moon rising. Okay. So I instantly thought, okay, I know where to stand. I know where to go. I've already scouted it out let's go. So I checked all my weather apps. There's a little screenshot there so you guys can see what I use. Mainly clear outside weather radar, Ventusky. Um, they're really, really good apps. Then you get on location. So using TPE or Photographer's Ephemeris, I can work out where to stand. The little baby blue line is where the moon was going to rise. And then the little very thin baby blue line was about 20 minutes after the moon rise. So I knew about 20 minutes after the sun should line up over old Harry Rocks, okay? And that was the plan. 
I wanted to line it up so the moon would come over the top. So I got there nice, nice and early. I think three hours before, because Rihanna came with me. So about three hours before. And this was what I was greeted with. So just pretty basic light. This is not an amazing photograph in any imagination, but just pretty basic light. I set the tripod up, got all my settings ready, and we just waited. So we managed to wait and capture it at sunset. So top left, where are we talking? About 20, 25 minutes. So we waited 25 minutes, got some lovely, nice light, lovely pink sky, golden light on there. But at the time, I didn't like the boat. <laughs> so didn't like the boat, didn't like the boys. I found it all distracting. There's someone wakeboarding over there. Oh, I don't get too close. So typical Photoshop fashion, Photoshop them out. And I was like, okay, I like that. That looks really, really nice. It's more what I was thinking the image would be, um, but it still wasn't what I was hoping to get while I was in the moment. That was what I was looking for. So the moon rose 40 minutes after. So 40 minutes after the actual sunset, we got the moon rise. And it was absolutely incredible. You can see I Photoshopped out all of the boats again. But what started to happen is the moon would rise right over Old Harry. So we had to reposition ourselves a little bit. And then the boat came into effect. And as you can see here, there's two bracketed exposures. Um, there, I think there were three stop. So in your cameras, you can set yourself to auto bracket, which I did for this, three stops. There's a bright exposure for the foreground. And then there's one for the moon. It's impossible to get that in one frame. Even using a graduated filter, you darken the sky too much and the moon would still be too dark and it would just look very odd. So the only way to do it cleanly was to bracket the exposures. This is when you then use luminosity masks. So I find this a lot more precise. I use one called Lumenzia. Um, it's produced by Greg Benz. I find it a lot easier to select the light areas, the highlight areas, and you can see each layer on the right hand side there that goes into processing an image. So this is where the P for processing comes in. So there's all those little steps that come across to merge the moon into the other file. You could do the auto HDR bracket in Lightroom, but because the moon would move ever so slightly between those shots, I think it's probably about two or three seconds in between the two and it only moves slightly. It's easy to bring them into Photoshop as separate files, auto align them to make sure they're spot on and then blend that way. After processing, that's the final image. You can see it's literally just a merge of the two. And that was the final image. And I, of course, decided to keep the boat in this one because it just lined up perfectly with the reflection of the moon. Processing is probably the stop, is the place where a lot of people stop, but actually you do have to print and it's one of the most rewarding processes. So we printed A1 and A2. Um, this was down at my friend's print studio down in Swanage. So it's quite ironic because it was old Harry Rotts. Um, and we, we spent, probably two or three hours on this. So we were going through all the different paper types. Um, I know that I've got two or three matte papers that I like to use the most. I like to use NST, platinum etching, um, sometimes smooth cotton. So we printed them on one each, and then at the end I settled on NST. So you can see the two variants just there, an A2 and an A1, and it just worked a lot better for the colors. You managed to get a nice smooth blend between the two. Another part of the process to me is I produce a calendar, very simple thing I can do, and it ends up being on the front cover of that calendar. So that's a little insight into the planned photograph process print selection, okay? I wanna to talk to you a little bit more about the print. So it's very important to have a calibrated monitor. A lot of people stop at the stage where they process, you'll get it onto your phone and it will look very, very different. Um, it's quite a normal thing. It's very hard to make it look identical. Even with a calibrated monitor, it can look a little bit different, okay? So get a good calibrated monitor. It's got a wide color gamut. And then all the all important bit is the printing and the paper, okay? So it's very important to get a good mix. I settled on the Canon printers just because I use Canon um, and I much prefer to the, no, using something I've used before. So Andy uses the Canon printer here. You can see the Pro 4000 in the background. And because I know the colors, the how the, the pigment inks work, um, I wanted to use something very similar at home as well. Because I only want to print A3. I don't want to print anything bigger because I'll go down to the studio. This is, I use the Canon Professional Print and Layout software. So it just works really well because I like white borders. I don't like to go full edge to edge all the time. Um, so I like to give a little white border, a little bit thicker at the bottom so I can number and sign. Um, and then from that, it's very easy for someone to mount it, okay? So they can just put a nice clean mount around um, and then get it framed. 
This was a little study I did, I think it was during COVID actually. Um, photo speed were kind of, I had about three papers I printed on and I was like, I'm, I'm missing out because I looked on PhotoSpeed website and saw how many varieties of paper they had. So I thought, okay, what I need to do is print one image on all the papers. So I managed to print on, I think it was like 35 papers. Um, so I went through each one. You can see how much texture variety there is between the papers. I did mats, I did gloss, semis, um, and some brighter papers as well. They were a selection that I liked the most. So I had four or five, um, but in the end, again, I settled on NST Bright White. It was just my favorite paper um, for this particular image. And a lot of woodland images work really well like that. This is a little bonus one. So as well as plan, photograph, process, and print, there's two extra Ps. So there's six. They could probably be seven, eight, nine, if I get cheesy enough. Can anyone guess what they could be? Um, the fact of continuing in an opinion or course of action in spite of difficulty or position. Any guesses? Passive, right, you got it, nailed. Okay, and then what about the second one? Oh man, nailed, yeah, there we go. So persistence, pers yeah, and then patience. Okay, so there are two that I find come in a lot later on. So when I first started landscape photography, it wasn't run and gun, but it was like, I go to a location, I know what, what photograph I'd wanted, I take it and I'd go home. The longer I got into photography, the more I understood photography, I started to be a lot more persistent. So I'd go back to the same location time and time again. I'd also be a lot more patient, okay? So here's a few little examples. <laughs> really cheesy one with an umbrella, but yeah. So at Knowlton Church, right next to me in Dorset, it's literally a five minute drive from my house. It's getting absolutely soaked on one day. It was raining, it was horrible, it was cold. Didn't bring a raincoat, just had a little jumper on. Um, but I was all set up for about, it must've been about two hours. Um, and in the end, the right, the picture on the right, we ended up, get, ended up getting a very little rainbow. Um, it was so tiny, um, wasn't that special. It was quite disappointing, um, but it didn't matter because I knew one day it would happen. Um, what I didn't know is it would happen when I didn't have my camera. And this was while I was at work. So I was on my drive home and I only had my iPhone. <laughs> so I had a full panic moment. There was photographers lined up and then there's me that comes out with my quick iPhone, but you have to make do with what you've got. So. I ended up getting that. Um, and in all honesty, you wouldn't know it was taken on an iPhone. Um, you can shoot in RAW on these phones now, it's absolutely incredible. And then obviously you can process it as you would in Lightroom back at home, which is exactly what I did here. You see the difference between the one on the right and that one there, you wouldn't really know what it was taken on. Um, but it's all about patience and persistence. And on that occasion, a lot of luck. <laughs> Again, same here, this is, one of those where it was just about patience. So I arrived at this location in Wimborne, set up the camera, set up the tripod, waited there for about three hours. And I just knew the light might change. It was a foggy morning. Didn't know if the sun would actually rise anywhere. I just knew it was gonna be over my shoulder. Um, and if the sun's over my shoulder, that's where I like to point my camera. So I know I'm gonna get side light, which is one of my favorite types of light for landscape photography. Blue hour was stunning. But to me, it's when the light rises, which was literally, <laughs> An hour? No, two hours, half five, hour and a half, literally after I took the first shot. So I didn't move for that whole time. So <laughs> it's a bit crazy, but it's worth staying there. I didn't, even, I didn't move the tripod one bit. You can see the post on the bottom right. It was just literally wait, take a picture every 10 minutes when the light changed, see what happened. And then when I get home, I might have 20, 30 pictures, um, not many, but I'd be able to go through those very quickly and see when the peak light hit because there was about another five or six like this on the right afterwards. Um, but it was this one where the light actually went all the way up the branches down to the end. So your eye goes through the image and down into the valley, uh, avenue, not valley. Uh, same example here. So one was taken literally during blue hour, very low aperture f 2.8, four seconds. And it's what I'd call a scouting shot or a preparation shot. So I was with a client and we were literally just framing up composition. Um, and I just said, look, let's just wait. We just need to sit down and wait. We went and walked around. We, we eyed up a few more compositions for the rest of the morning. So we didn't waste our time. And then we just went back to the cameras and waited for the light to rise. And the difference between the two is depth. The full dynamic range is covered. Um, this was just a one exposure, just exposed for the sky, managed to bring out the, high, the shadows. Um, and it's just a very big difference between the two. So just be very patient. Um, and if it wasn't like this, be persistent and come back the next day. Don't be scared to keep coming back. 
This is more to do with panoramic, another P. Ugh, that's so cringe. Um, okay, but please do play around with panoramic images because they are great fun. Um, you can crop very heavily, which is, if you're a pixel people like me and you like to zoom in, it's so rewarding. But the thing is, I knew there was two images here. There was one of the whole view and the snow was falling so heavy. Everyone was already back in the van because they were getting absolutely drenched. But I stayed out because I knew there was a shot here. So all I did is put my filter case over the top of the lens, um, protected it from the snow as much as I can and put a filter cloth every three or four seconds, just wiping it off, taking a picture. Um, and I took six shots here. Uh, I had to bump the ISO right up to 800. I say right up, that's nothing for these modern day cameras. Um, I literally don't even take ISO into account nowadays. I just shoot um, whatever I need to do to get the picture. Aperture first, then I work on shutter speed. And then the ISO is just whatever it needs to be. You can see the three mountains at the back. When I crop this in, you get a whole new image out of that same image. You've got so much data. Um, this is a 45 megapixel camera, but with six shots, oh, I can't even do the maths off the top of my head, but it's a very big image. Um, so we could print this two meters easily um, and you get all the, day, all the detail in the houses, every single window, but also more importantly, the light on the mountains. Um, and every bit of snow falling, because we use quite a fast shutter, which was 320th of a second. So capturing all that motion. This is back on to persistence. But I, while I was working, I took, was it six or seven days off work? It might have been 10. I think it was two weeks. It was two weeks. So I took two whole weeks off work. My boss thought I was crazy when he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to go in the wood and photograph bluebells. He thought I was even more crazy. Um, but I had six mornings with absolutely nothing. Um, no conditions whatsoever until this morning where we had incredible soft fog coming across here. This is a raw file. This is untouched, um, straight away raw file, but it was a nine shot pano. I had a lot of time. The conditions weren't changing. So I, I made the most of my scene by taking a nine shot panorama. And this is the final edited version. So I cropped right in over here and stopped the image just about on the, on the second third. And then I brightened it up, dropped the clarity, add in a little bit of, um, uh, a radial tool over here and I just I just softened that out by bringing in a little bit more of a, a warmer tone um, and that was the final image and then of course you've got to print it nice and big so it went back down to the print studio this was a one and a half meter print that went off over to America um, I haven't got a picture of it framed yet the client's not sent it through yet but um, very very big image and it's amazing because you see every single detail I was hoping to have one here with you today so apologies I don't but you can see every single bluebell um, and it just makes, it's nice because I relive that moment when I print it. If it's stuck on my phone, I'm seeing it on like a, what, four inch screen. Um, it's okay, but I know deep down when you see it this big, you relive the whole experience. Um, and yeah, that's me. And then this is how you can follow me if you want to get in touch, um, drop me a message. We've got Instagram, Facebook and Vero. Feel free to come and say hello, have a look at my portfolio. Um, and if anyone ever wants to come on a workshop or a one-to-one -one or purchase a print, um, have a look at my website first. I put everything on my website before I go on social media. Um, it's kind of like my, my hub as such. But um, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to fire away and I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. So I use a Spider. So I think it's the Spider 5 calibrator. Um, so it's made by Data Color. Um, and it's a very quick process. It takes about five minutes. Um, just pop it on. I use a BenQ monitor, uh, which is uh, that one there, which is the SW271C. I think that's right. Sam knows his tech stuff well. Um, and it's really good because it's got a USB and it's, it's already got a calibration device in it as well. So instead of actually calibrating it into your computer directly, um, you just plug it into the USB on the actual monitor, pop it through the little hood at the top, pop it on the screen, go through the process, and it's done. Um, but it's, it's very important to do that, even if you're just sharing on social media. Um, I'd, I'd recommend that being the first thing you do. Even with Apple Macs, I mean, even when I got this, I calibrated it straight away. Even though they're supposed to be quite accurate, um, I'd recommend doing it to every machine you work on. Any other questions at all?
Oh. I can't get that far. So you can I just want to say your dedication is amazing and there's no half measures and you can see how much time and effort goes into every single shot to get the best out of that scene. You're too kind. And Thank how you. all the P's are so important. <laughs> so, thanks for the lesson. <laughs> Thank actually, you. if I just ask you one quick one. Of course, of course. Of course. There's a, there was a lot of uh, preparation you were talking about. Yeah. How often do you... That's another P. I know, we're eight P's in. Are we eight P's I, in? I, I've drunk a lot of water going. today. Oh, gosh. Um, how often... Because it sounds to me like commonly you're going out with a clear idea of the photo you want in mind because yeah. of all that prep you've done. Yeah. How yeah. often do you actually find you need to sort of change gear midstream because the conditions might be different or I, I know you'd probably put that back to I'll come back another time mm -hmm. to get what I was going to get in the first place yeah. but do, do you find sometimes you know it's not as it was so you have to kind of change gear and are you yeah. comfortable do you feel okay doing that or do you yeah, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean yeah no that's a really good question yeah sometimes like I'll go to a location with a photo in mind um, I'll know what lens I'm going to use I know the composition um, but then sometimes it will completely change um, and I love that because you're exploring new then so you might be out in the hills, you might be looking at different individual compositions. Um, but yeah, no, I'm always, always ready. And um, it is nice to be on edge sometimes and just not know, go out and not know what you're going to photograph. Um, so even though preparation I find is key, sometimes going out with just a free mind um, is really refreshing. And I often do that a lot of my scouting sessions. So we'll uh, go out and refresh the brain a little bit and take the camera, even if it's middle of the day. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I Thank was just you. going to point out, Jack, did, he mentioned it in the talk. He's done some videos. They're on the Photospeed YouTube channel uh, looking close at the different paper types. And it's a question I think the guys get asked a lot at Photospeed. And you can't really know until you print a few images out. So I would say check out those videos that Jack's done because it shows you like literally right up close, doesn't it, of the paper surface. Yeah, we go through that little loop. So yeah. I, I find it really fascinating to zoom in and have a look at the detail. Yeah. And also there's the test packs that Photospeed, Photospeed sell and they're a really good way just to get two or three different types of paper and then do like what Jack did when he was talking about with the same image, just print the same image on multiple papers and then you start to get a feel, don't you, for what you know is going to work on certain things. Yeah, you know, you kind of know instantly what kind of paper is going to work for what image, like whether it's a seascape and it needs a slight gloss to it to give it that reflection um, or if it's a woodland image and I go for a more of a matte textured paper to kind of make the leaves and the, the bark feel like crunchy. Um, so yeah, it, it's worth use probably printing on a dozen different types of paper with the same image just yeah. to see the difference. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there. But if you do want to come and have a chat with Jack about anything in particular, just jump on, jump on him. I'm sure he'll be fine. He's a big lad. He can look after himself. But, yeah, yeah, we're good. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming along. We are back tomorrow with some more talks. Jack's back. I'm back. Colin Pryor at 11. That's going to be fantastic. And Julian and Margaret later in the afternoon as well. But thank you very much for now. Thanks, Jack. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.